If you have been watching the Chinese drama Winter Begonia, Bin Bian Bu Shi Hai Tang Hong, you might find Jing Ju, Beijing Opera, a very intriguing art form. In today's video, I am going to attempt introducing that to you. It is a very complex art form, and there's a lot to talk about, and I'm no expert in it. So today's video is based on a lot of research. If you happen to be a Beijing opera lover and expert, I welcome you to share the knowledge that you have about this art form in the comment section. So first, I want to talk about the origin of this art form. Then I'm going to go into more details about the different categories of performances, all the interesting details related to the practicing of this art form. And then finally, I'll introduce you to some of the current Dramaland actor actresses coming from that background and the difference between this art form performed today and how it was viewed historically. I will also leave links to videos that will give you a much better understanding about the stuff that I talk about in this video. So let's start first with the historical background. When you are watching Bing Bian Bu Shi Hai Tang Hong, you will come across this word very often, which is called Li Yuan. Literal translation is pear garden or pear orchard. Li Yuan Hang. Hang means profession, the profession of Xi Chu performance. So Beijing Opera is included under that big umbrella. The word Xi Chu, Xi means drama or play, Chu means song or tune. Together, they include all different kinds of traditional Chinese singing operas, cross time and geological locations. The reason why they use pair to represent this profession really started in Tang Dynasty. And can you guess which famous emperor is this related to? Yes, it's the most famous Tang Dynasty emperor, Tang Minghuang, Li Longji. The emperor that you see in the film Legend of the Demon Cat, the emperor that inspired one of the greatest long love poetry, Chang Heng Ge, that I talked about in Fan Xian's reciting poetry videos. His story and Yang Guifei's story is one of the most famous historical love stories in China. Throughout Li Longji's life, he is a huge enthusiast of dramatic singing, dancing performance. He's himself a super expert in music, in singing, in dancing, in all that art. And unlike other social elites of the time, he pays a lot of respect to this art form and he himself actually does performances for fun. So when he was in power, the Xi Chu performance was hugely popular. He started official training organizations for musicians, dancers, singers. And back then in Chang'an, where he started the school and institution is called Li Yuan because there are a lot of pear trees planted around that region. So the traditional singing, dancing, performancing profession in China recognized this emperor as their professional ancestor. And Li Yuan, the word, become a synonym to Xi Chu, drama play performance and singing performances. There are many types of Chinese Xi Chu. In Winter Begonia, you will see the most well-known Jing Ju, literally means the capital plays. But it's by no means the only form of traditional Xi Chu in China. In different regions, there are different types of traditional Xi Chu. For example, from where I'm from, the Sichuan province, famous for Chuan Ju, Sichuan play. The most iconic performances and crazy skills of Chuan Ju is Bian Lian, changing face, where the performer will change tens and tens of face in one performance. And the secret of how it is done with such a fast speed that you can't even decipher with high-speed camera is still unknown to people outside of this profession. You will see that performance in the recent web drama Shao Zhu Qian Man Xing, I've fallen for you. So Jing Ju, the capital play or Beijing opera is by no means the only one among many, many different types of traditional Chinese Xi Chu, but it is definitely the best known one. As you can tell from this name, Jing literally meaning capital, this is a form of performance that became consolidated and widely accepted in Beijing. And interestingly enough, its history is not actually that long. Today, when we look at Beijing opera's history, we would often recognize the very end of 18th century, 1790, 
in that year. It's the beginning of the creation of the finalized version of Beijing Opera to celebrate Emperor Qianlong's birthday. One of the most famous Qing Dynasty emperor that you see in hundreds and hundreds of screen portrayal in Chinese drama land. The court invited four main performing troops from Huizhou, currently in the province of Anhui, to travel to the capital to perform for the emperor. These four main troops brought in the style of singing and performance from where they were at the time that was super popular and influenced the existing types of performance that were there in Beijing throughout the entire 19th century. These performing styles get developed, melted, combined, figuring out the different plays, writing the lyrics, consolidating the singing styles, the movements, costumes, everything that you can think of. And by the beginning of last century, Jing Ju's final version started to form. The golden era of Beijing opera is really right around 1920s, and it has produced some of the best known performers in Jing Ju's history. Also because that was the time when photography and forms of recording started to become available, which is why today you can see still some of those performers' live performance gets captured, which also hugely helped the rapid growth of popularity of this art form. So that very brief history introduction aside, let's talk about some of the basic facts and knowledge about Beijing opera. Traditionally, both men and women can be Beijing opera performers. Throughout history, there are different categories of roles that you can play. It started with, as you can imagine, more categories and finally finalized into the recognized four main categories today, which are called sheng, dan, jing, chou. This in Chinese is being called hang dang, literally means your professional categories. So if you are a sheng rose singer, you are most likely throughout your lifetime to work on this particular types of roles, you will not do other types of roles. If you pick the Dan professional categories, you will be working on that for the rest of your life. It is pretty impossible to attempt multiple categories because each category has its particular ways of doing everything. So what are the essential differences between these categories? Let's start with first Sheng. Sheng, the character literally means birth. It can also mean gentlemen. So here it means male roles. Within the sheng category, there are subcategories such as young men, older men, men who are specialized in kung fu. And for each subcategories, there are specific skills that the performer needs to learn. And interestingly enough, both men and women can play male roles. Although obviously most of the sheng roles will be played by men. There have been very famous female performers of male roles. For example, in the film Mei Lan Fang, led by Li Ming and Zhang Ziyi, you'll see Zhang Ziyi playing the very famous historical performer Meng Xiaodong, a woman who is known for playing old man roles, Lao Sheng. It is the same with Dan Jiu, the second category Dan, which means female roles. And often the most famous stars of Beijing opera performers are men playing female roles. In the Dan category, it also has many subcategories. Each subcategory has its very specific and differences in terms of how they would sing, how they would perform, their makeup, and their character types. In the drama Winter Begonia, you'll see our lead male character, Shang Xirui. He started playing Sheng roles when he was younger, but he changed his category to play Dan roles, female roles, later. Then for the Jing Hangdang, Literal character meaning is clean. It's men again, but it's particular types of men. When you play Jing Hangdang, very often you would paint your face. That is very well known in the world when you talk about Beijing opera. A lot of times people think of those painted faces. These are particular male roles, often famous historical figures, such as the warring state periods Rose Cao Cao or the very famous Song Dynasty 
包公 Then the final one, 丑 literally meaning ugly. Yeah. So those are the roles who are funny, who are the joker, who are the clowns. Of the story, they usually carry the most exciting part of a performance because they dance, they sing, they do funny things, and actually very acrobatic, difficult performances on stage. And they are signified by this very classic makeup of a white patch around their nose, making them look like the Chinese version of clowns. So now you see the four main categories of roles. Who do you think would have the highest respect? Within the profession, I'll give you three seconds to guess. Da 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 da! Did you expect that? Most of the time, it is the sheng and the dan zhuo makes the performer most famous. As you can imagine, it's pretty much like today when we look at dramas, right? It's the lead male, the lead female, the younger generation roles gets most. Attention, and it's kind of the same with Beijing opera performances. But why is clown roles most respected? Well, because historically, the emperor that I mentioned right at the beginning of this video, the professional ancestor of Xi Qu, Li Longji, liked to play clown roles. Back then, when he wanted to join the performance, he would like to pick the clown roles, and because he was the emperor. That is the reason why this particular category still gets the highest respect today within the profession. But also because most of the time, their performance actually is the hardest to do, hardest to learn, involves a lot of skills that requires years of excruciatingly painful practices. Therefore, they get the highest respect within a performance troupe. The chou zhuo, the chou rose players. Have some privileges over other performers. The cases where they store their costumes and their expensive headpieces, jewelries are forbidden to be set on, apart from clown roles performers. Maybe that has something to do with the tradition of not sitting on camera cases, as I've mentioned in one of my previous videos today in the drama land. I'm not sure if in Winter Begonia there are gonna be a lot of depiction of. Clown roles. I doubt there would be, but it's definitely an interesting piece of information to know. There's also different pi styles of singing the same role. For example, for the female roles, the most famous style is Mei Pai. Started with the very famous performer Mei Lanfang. So for the same role, same play. Different style have different ways of singing, and it lies in the details of their performances. And that is definitely the second level, the higher level of understanding of Beijing opera. In terms of the singing styles, it is a mixture of using your real voice and your fake voice, or more accurately, using your voice around here, vibrating, or using your head. A nose voice. For example, if you play older roles such as old woman, old man, you would often use more of your real voice. If you play younger men and younger women, you would use your fake voice. And for example, Ying Zheng's role in Winter Begonia mostly plays Dan Zhuo, so his role is exclusively using his fake, his head voice, and that gives you the particular high pitch. Sound. I never learned Beijing opera singing, but I can attempt to make that sound to give you an idea about for those female, young female roles, the singer, what part of the voice the singer would use. They would sing and talk with this same fake head voice. If you're always singing with your real voice at that pitch, you're gonna pretty much exhaust your voice very quickly. I'll also leave a few links. Of professional Beijing opera singers singing current contemporary songs, and in the title of those links, I'll explain what type of roles they sing and what type of style they're using. One of the video is really fun because the female singers is actually doing a soundtrack song from the Untamed with Beijing opera style singing. So that is a super brief introduction to the types of roles of Beijing opera singing.
But no matter what hangdang you're in, for all the performers, the amount of work that goes into learning it and become good at it is quite intense and insane. You don't just have to be able to sing, you have to do a lot of physical work and acquire very difficult skills. I'll link some of the videos of a couple of classic extremely difficult skills that Beijing Opera performers would demonstrate on stage for a particular place. You can go and check it out and decide whether that is absolutely painful to learn. There's one skill that is very insanely inhumane and hardly really performed by a lot of people today, which is called Qiao Gong. You will see that being presented in the drama Winter Begonia. Basically, people with normal sized feet, both men and women, wearing those fake small feet to play female roles. Because in Chinese history, for a very long period, women had to bond their feet growing up, creating those absolutely horrendously tiny feet. And for the performer who have normal sized feet, they have to wear this particular type of high heel shoes that doesn't have heel. So heel free, but 10 centimeter heels. And dance and walk and jump on tables and even jump on the handrest, the backrest of a chair. Their whole performance is carried out wearing those insanely high heelless high heel shoes. That is super hard. It has no support. Unlike ballet dancer who can rest and go back on their point. Once you are in those shoes, you are in it all the time throughout the performance. It is one of the most painful way of performing on stage. And that's just one crazy skills Beijing opera performers will have to learn if they're doing particular types of roles. Also, the makeup process of dressing up as a role is usually extremely exhausting and time consuming and painful. Did you imagine that? Because there is a process during this makeup called leitou, literally means strangling your head. I will leave a link in the description to show you a process of dressing up. Somewhere down the line, they will have to use a strip to pull up the side of the face to make your eyebrow go up so that you can see in dress up performances. Most of the rows have very slanted eyes. This is to create that very open eye look that gives you that extra sense of this performer is very excited. Expressions looks more magnified. But because of that practice, it does a lot of damage to the performer's skin. It makes your skin sag more easily over time. And because the tight pull of everything around your head, it has a lot of pressure added onto your head. Once you finish having the makeup on, just by talking, that vibration in your head will make your head hurt. It takes years for those professional performers to get used to the pain of putting that much stuff on their head. And that's just the start of it. Once you have the head and fake hair or tied on, you have to wear crazy head pieces, such as Shang Xire's role of Yang Guifei. I mean, imagine that weight on your head and perform for hours. Afterwards, when you take it off, you will probably want to die because of the headache, because of the sweating. So Beijing opera performers have to withstand some of the most painful experiences all the time. Today, working in the Chinese drama and film land, there are actually a lot of actors, actresses who used to be trained as Beijing opera or similar type of xiqi singers that have changed their professional career and went to acting. One of the most well-known person would be Li Qin. Before she played Xue Baochai and officially turned on her professional track as an actress, she was trained as a Qi singer. So Qi is a different type of xiqi than Beijing opera, but has some very old ties with it. You would first recognize that her makeup, full makeup as a Qi role is very similar to Jing Ju. But in terms of the performance, Qi is very different from Jing Ju. Qi is an older form of performance. It didn't go through that process of its original form going to Beijing, going through a centuries of adaptation. It has existed on its own for quite a long time. And its plays are based on some ancient writings that are considered as the elegant writing with very poetic and very beautiful words. Qi is a song based 
performance. So every play has multiple songs and they all have their own tunes. And the people who sing that usually are dancing at the same time. They hardly ever stand still. They're always moving with the lyrics they're singing. Whereas in Jinju performance, you will very often see that most of the time when they sing, they don't move that much. When they move, they move without singing. Also, Jinju performance is not song based. When you start to get into Beijing Opera, you'll realize a lot of the different plays sound very similar. They kind of always follow the same kind of tune. That is because there aren't that many set tunes. So the different plays really hinges on different movements and different lyrics. This is why you can create a new Beijing Opera play, as you see in Winter Begonia, relatively fast because you really need a good writer to write you a new script with different words, sung and spoken. But in terms of the tunes that you would use for the performance, there are only that many. You just mix and match of the existing types of tunes and you're good to go. So those are the very distinctive differences between Quinchu and Jiongju. Li Qing used to be a professional Quinchu singer before she decided to become an actress. There are actually quite a few old videos of her singing Quinchu when she was much younger. I'll leave the links in the description below. Usually we would consider the actors and actors who had Xichu training background have certain advantages. For example, when they play period drama roles, they tend to know better how to hold themselves physically, the posture, the movement, how they walk, how they use their hands, how they look at people tend to be more expressive and more elegant. That comes from years of training. Finally, about this profession, past versus now, back in the heydays of Beijing opera, the 1920s, the first half of last century, although some of the Jure stars of Beijing operas have a lot of money, have a lot of supporters, they are the superstars of the time. Societally, though, they are considered to be the lower class people. They are considered to be as low as prostitutes, which is the lowest of the lowest possible. So it creates this very weird contrast between the love, respect, money famous Beijing opera singers can get versus the prejudice against them, which is no matter how good and how popular you are, you are still considered to be a low class citizen. You are pretty much a plaything for the rich and powerful people. This is the very weird and twisted thing with Beijing opera performers and any really Xichu performers in the old China. And if you watch Winter Begonia, you'll see that represented in the drama in all kinds of forms. Obviously, that's no longer applicable today because even though a lot of people are not familiar with this old art form, they have great respect for the performers. They know how difficult it is to be trained and to work in this profession. The golden era of Beijing opera is certainly gone. Today it has become a much smaller art form in terms of how many people are interested in it, how many people are hardcore fans because today's entertainment is so westernized and also so heavily impacted by the industrialization of entertainment business. Young people in China today listen mostly K-pop, R&B, hip-hop, stuff coming from the West. Hardly anyone has the interest and time and energy to go into learning first, learning, then fall in love with Beijing Opera because there's so much you need to know and learn and understand about this performance before you can get into it. Why a particular performance is considered to be brilliant or not good enough lies in your first understanding of all the details and intricacies of this art form that is kind of very removed from your daily life and how you use language and the type of music that you are constantly being bombarded with today living in contemporary world. It is in competition with stuff that has just much more money backing it up. Personally, I am no expert and I find 
getting into Beijing Opera a quite difficult task, even for a Chinese-born native Chinese person who is pretty good at languages. I can't imagine the difficulty of somebody coming from a different culture who do not speak the language trying to get into Beijing Opera and understanding what is the beauty and intricacy of this art form. But you never know. You never know that it may just trigger somebody, some part of the brain, that the particular nature and certain things in Beijing Opera will make people who seemingly are completely unrelated to it fall in love with it madly. That could happen too. And you may be one of them if you decide to dive into it. So at the end of this video, I hope my introduction has helped you understanding better about Beijing Opera. And if you're curious about all those interesting aspects backstage, performance-wise, that I've talked about through this video, please do check out the linked videos in the description box. And if somehow this video has initiated some lifelong love relationship with Beijing Opera, this old art form from China, then I think the video has fulfilled its purpose. Thank you for watching Avenue X. I'll see you in my next video. Meanwhile, live long and happy drama watching.